Oh, Jennifer, this book is coming out right at the perfect time. My God, one of the biggest movies in the theaters right now is Mean Girls, and people need to know this story. That's right. That's right. It's it's very exciting. Was it timed out like this on purpose, or is this just, oh boy, wow, look what's happening? I, I so want to lie to you and say it was all part of a master plan, but it was a coincidence. It's very strange, though. It's it's one of those things where, you know, because I've seen both of them. I've experienced both both different versions of it in the way that I think the musical side of it gives it even a deeper story into what's going on with, with within our own chapters. Because we all like to sing. Let me sing in, in Mean Girls. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm a musical theater nerd, too, and I always feel like the great thing about musicals is they can like let you into a character's soul, right? They can sing something they would never necessarily say. What was it that drew you to this book? Because I mean, it's it's almost like one of those, you, you know the wizard behind the curtain and you're taking us with you to take a sneak peek. That's right. I'm always looking for uh, things, you know, things, <laughs> pop cultural phenomena, let's say, that... Um, first of all, resonate. And obviously it's 20 years and this has been, you know, we're still talking about it. So I'm always interested in why, why there's something that lasts and other things don't, you know, and also just kind of having a bigger effect than just, oh, we like this movie. It's that, you know, you, it, it really infects our everyday lives. So we're still quoting this movie. There are characters in this movie who inspired people, changed people's lives. Um, the way that it, it kind of, you know, invaded the internet at a key moment. We still use the memes every day. We use it when we talk about politics. We use it when we talk about our friendships. And so I think that's the kind of stuff that I'm always looking for when I'm looking for something to write about. There has to be something to say for 300 pages. There has to be a story to tell. And so this you know, kind of lived up to that. Do you think the relatability is because Tina Fey had her ear on the ground and she knew the vibration of what the generation was doing? I do. I do think so, which is, you know, she it's this happens a lot, right, with any kind of movie like this. Like, obviously, she was older than the people in the movie. She was a, around 30. But I think, you know, it also is so timeless mm -hmm. that she related to the material herself. You know, she remembered her teenage years and being awkward. And in her case, she's talked about, you know, kind of like making jokes as a defense mechanism in her case. And, you know, that's just, she felt like there hadn't been a teen movie that did that. Mm -hmm. And she was right. And it was a huge gap that there was to fill. And she did it in this way that is so fun and funny. You know, that's the part. It's like a kind of serious subject. If you think about it, it's girls bullying each other. But it's she made it fun and funny and gave us an uplifting message in the end. I'll tell you the thing that I've always loved about it is that she didn't have to go the dirty route like Porky's did and movies like that. It, you know, those were teen movies, too. And even Fast Times at Ridgemont High, they still went that route. Tina didn't have to do that. And look, she's still just as strong today. Exactly, exactly. They actually really deliberately wanted this movie to be for teen girls. This is a huge, it's like a huge plot point in my book that the, their PG-13 rating was like, this is what we have to have because young girls need to be able to go see this. Yes. And so they did so much work. She actually had a slightly dirtier original script and then they cleaned it up and then they actually had to clean it up one more time wow. in post-production and change some lines that were key um, to get that PG-13 rating. This was like, you know, it, it just felt like life or death to them to have that rating. And I think in the end, like, it's still incredibly funny. She, mm -hmm. Like you said, I kind of like that this isn't about sexy, dirty stuff. It's just this, like, clean you know, clear story that um, still has incredibly funny jokes. I think the jokes are hilarious, so we didn't lose anything. You're going to think I'm a freak, but I think this new version of Mean Girls is the grease of this generation. It's really, it's like, I mean, it does kind of combine the original, I think, with the stage musical. Mm -hmm. And so then it kind of like brings it all together. And it's got new stuff, right? They updated some jokes um, and by the way, I am I was a huge Grease fan. Um, <laughs> it was like foundational for me. Um, so I love that. You know, one, one of the things that listeners need to understand is that, I mean, I realize this is a book from, from you sharing the story, but you physically sat down with the directors, the crew members, and everybody else that was involved. You're really giving us a good inside peek here. 
Yeah, it, I was especially pleased to talk to the director, Mark Waters. Um, he did such a wonderful job and maybe, you know, doesn't always get recognized because people are so focused on Tina Fey, but he it's so tightly directed and tightly edited. And he also was so good with the kids. I mean, they were young adults, mostly they were old teenagers, young 20s, but still that's pretty young for a whole cast for the most, you know, except for the teachers and uh, parents. He was he had this huge cast of very young people and everyone talked to me about how good he was mm -hmm. with them. He allowed them to have fun and play and improvise and he would just have them do like a million takes and yeah. keep them going and keep their energy up. He was in every single audition, even for all of those high schoolers you see kind of in the background or who had one line. He was in every single audition to pick these kids, often was picking kids with almost no experience because he just liked their vibe and wanted to work with them. Mm -hmm. And I loved being able to kind of talk to him about this and also just kind of give him credit. You talk about those people in the background. That's one of my weaknesses, or it could be a strength when it comes to movie watching. I love watching the background because I think there's Easter eggs in everything. There is, and this must have been, I would think, one of your favorites for that because they really created a high school. You mm -hmm. know, they they went through the trouble, like Mark Waters again, he named every character, he would talk to each person about their character and be like, you would be into this and this, and you'd want to be friends with her. But she, you know, like he had a whole idea for every one of these characters and they all have their own clicks. Each of each click has their own like little Regina George <laughs> in it, in the background. And they were played all by um, Toronto Canadian actors because it was in Toronto. And I think it helped a lot because they all knew each other mm -hmm. or that all, but a lot of them knew each other from other auditions and just being around. And so it really gave this feel of like an actual high school that was surrounding the Mean Girls, which was important because Regina needs like a kingdom to rule over, right? Oh, yeah. You need to have that feeling. And a lot of them got some of those amazing one-liners that remain really famous to this day, both because we like to quote them and because we like to meme them. Yeah, yeah. The book we're talking about is called So Fetch, The Making of Mean Girls. Here's how big this movie is still in our life. I don't know if you caught the the Real Housewives of Utah, but at the end, did you see that? They brought out a burn yeah. book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's really everywhere. I had a um, Google alert on Mean Girls for this book mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see how all the places that this phrase shows up i mean every realm of life politics definitely reality tv is just a girl time <laughs> um it's just it's incredible to see wow so do you think that people have burn books i mean because i mean oh my god i mean they, just to watch it come back to life in the new movie you know you still have that emotion you're going oh my god oh man yeah. And, you know, I love how the burn book still looks the same. It's like it is so it just they, what they just nailed it with the way it looked in the original. And it's like we cannot I mean, they, we built my um, book cover on that. Like it is just this iconic look that we all go like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is. I, I never had a burn book. I, you know, I, I hope people don't really have them. <laughs> I, I, to this day, I still have a photo album that I had when I was a teenager. And so when I saw the burn book and I saw the way they put the photos and stuff in there, I was like, my God, that is almost like my, my book of photography as a kid. I mean, from when I was a hockey player to the band and all that kind of stuff and, and a time I'll never get back, but it's still fun to look at. I did have the, that. I had a lot of photo albums like yeah. that, that I lovingly like put the foot, right? Like. All that stuff. So I did. Ha I do. I do relate to that part. Did you keep anything in there? Because I. I have a dollar bill in there that was signed by Leif Garrett. To this day, oh. I hold on to that thing. <laughs> that is amazing. I definitely had some like. I had a lot of stuff that was like, oh, this card that this boy gave me or whatever. Right, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. When did you know that you were going to be a writer? And I and I realize that you know even when I talk with authors, I still call them writers only because writing to me is a, is so deep into the soul. You are a writer, and that that is an author. That's right. And I usually I think I say writer only because I do multiple things, yeah, right? And yeah. some of them are writing, some of them them are writing a book. Um, I mean, always, but definitely by the time I was about eight or so, mm -hmm. um, I was. I had like an electric typewriter, an old electric typewriter my mom gave me. And I would just sit there and I wrote these little short stories. And then I started um, writing plays that I would make my 
um, friends do in the garage with me. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of just went from there. I, you know, I, and I was interested in all different kinds of writing. I wanted to be even a freelance writer specifically since I was quite young, I would take out books from the library on like how to be a writer yeah. and just learn the business. And definitely always, I loved the library. So I really dreamed of being an author. Oh, and that freelance writer. What I love about that is the fact that it's like, cause people go, you, you need to, you need to go take some lessons and get some better technique. I don't want to write like them. I want to write like me. Yeah, absolutely. I think practice is the big practice in writing mm -hmm. is always what I say. I do teach writing classes, but I feel like in the end, like I'm not sure that they're that useful. Maybe getting feedback is the other part of that. But if you just write and practice a lot, have other people read it and you read, I think that's all you really need. All right, Miss Writing Teacher, I've got a question for you. I do you think that mm -hmm. sometimes uh, we we use too many run on sentences and sentences are too long? Because if we were to write the way we speak, there'd be a lot more periods and commas. That is very true. But I mean, you know, I one of the big idols of my life was the author Tom Wolf. Hmm. And um he was the king of the long sentence among and the crazy <laughs> punctuation among other things. And I thought he was he was such a genius at doing kind of what you're talking about, which is like he could mimic the way his thoughts came out or the way he spoke. But also, like you, this is a you have to know the rules to break the rules thing, right? You have to you have to know the way to do it, and then you have to find the way the the kind of right way to express the things the way you you want to express them. And we all know that's a lot harder than it seems like it should be because otherwise everyone would do it all the time. Every editor has one spot in a book that they go, man, I, I, I like where you were going, but it didn't reach me. We're going to have to remove it. Did you have one of those in this book? We definitely cut a lot of stuff. Wow. Um, we did. Uh, I have, I had good stuff on the cutting room floor for sure. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I love, it is hard because especially if you do interviews and stuff like that, you just get attached um, you kind of want to put like if, if somebody bothered to talk to you, <laughs> you kind of want to put it in. Um, so I think maybe I just had just too much to work with, um, which is great. But yeah, we definitely had a few things where it was just like, let's keep moving forward mm -hmm. instead of going on this side journey. Um, yeah, but there was just, it's like, I guess that's a good thing. There's too much good stuff. These interviews you're talking about, we are all communication specialists these days. Are they going right. to, are they going to sit on a hard drive in your computer forever? Or are you going to share those real conversations with the rest of us? I was, th I've been working on trying to figure out, I actually had a list of some of the stuff that I, um, that I cut from the book that I really liked that I was like, Oh, I got to figure out. Cause I've been doing like TikTok. I'm like, should I do it there? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I'm going to do it yet, but we'll figure out something to do with my bonus material. What did you learn from this, from this particular journey? Oh, that's such a nice question. Um, I mean, I think that I just, really came away with an even better appreciation of this movie and of it's the way that it um, took its audience seriously, mm -hmm. even while being very, very funny, right? I think being very, very funny, that was my takeaway. Being very, very funny is a way of taking an audience seriously. It gave this audience this incredibly quotable, genuinely funny, kind of dark yeah, <laughs> sometimes yeah. edgy movie it allowed the girls to be flawed um i really love that and it, so i kind of came away with this new appreciation for humor as a way of kind of taking an audience seriously even though it was written about the girls there it, to me it represents all people there were so many people represented in this story absolutely i totally agree i mean i've been saying this that i think that Mean Girls, the con you know that kind of concept at the center of this, the ways that the girls kind of operate and you know try to take each other down and want to be, but also want to be a part of it. All of that is of all of us, right? Mm -hmm. It goes across genders, it goes across age. Um, a friend of mine was recently telling me how you know her the way she said it was her grandmother was dealing with a Mean Girls situation at the nursing mm -hmm. home over a mahjong game. So like. It, it you don't it doesn't ever go away um it you know you'll hear people use it even in politics to apply to all genders you know what i mean like you'll just always hear this and it gave us this way i think just the mean girls the title gave us a way of referring to this sort of situation where we all understand 
And it was something that in the original source material, the book called Queen Bees and Wannabes, which is a nonfiction book that it was based on, she called it relational aggression. But that's a pretty, um, <laughs> that's a, a hard phrase to use <laughs> in everyday life. Um, and so I think relational aggression becoming just like when you say it's a mean girl situation or she's such a Regina George, it's like we know what that is. What I've loved about this with Tina Fey is that she hasn't tried to outdo this this movie. It's like, you know, like when Fleetwood Mac did Rumors, the next one had to be better than Rumors or the Eagles with Hotel California. It had to be better than. And Tina Fey just keeps being Tina Fey. She's I mean, she's extraordinary. I think her. um just like inherent humor and wit is so unbelievable. I used to interview her like in the 2000s when I would say kind of the, I covered like the rise of Tina Fey. Mm -hmm. And you know, when she was doing this and then 30 Rock and then, um, you know, Sarah Palin and kind of exploding. Um, I used to talk to her a fair amount and it was always striking to me how we'd get on the phone and even if we had 10 minutes, you know, it's like, okay, you gotta talk about your new book, let's go. <laughs> We just rattle like she'd say like all the perfect things that you needed her to say in the 10 minutes and it'd be like we're good we're good all right, I love right. That. and what also was striking is so many times i would go read the other stuff all the other interviews she did for that and it would be different and i was like most of the time if you get really good jokes like that it's like they're saying it over and over again she would just she was just always kind of able to be on and rattling off jokes and it was just incredible when you say that it shaped a generation, do you think it's because it kind of identifies the snobs of life and that in reality that um, if, if we're, we, we're so easily influenced to become a snob ourselves? Absolutely. And it, it gave us a way to talk about all this, like I was saying, and kind of all the quotes, right? The way that we can quote it, I think, defines the generation the way that um, I think, you know, I was talking to somebody else and it was like, the way you can kind of like say it to a person and if they know what you're talking about, you know that you're their kind of person, um, right? It's just, it it kind of gave us this language uh, among people who love this movie to talk about this stuff and became memes and gifs and yeah. all of this other stuff kind yeah. of morphed into its own thing. I, I don't think this could be a guys movie in the way of replacing the girls with guys because I, I just think the relationships between guys and girls are just so different. For sure. And actually, um, the author of Queen Bees and Wannabes, uh, Rosalind Wiseman, actually ended up writing like a second book really? that was just about boys because she felt like it was different enough. And I think that just has to do with, it's not like gender essentialism. It just has to do with the way we raise girls versus boys is right. just different. And so they have different kind of tools at their disposal and roles that they might play. Wow. Jennifer, you, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you so much. This was fun. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thanks, you too. <laughs>